Welcome to the Crypto Campfire. They're everyone's favorite midnight snack, Mitch and the Professor, featuring special guest David Gold. Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of the Crypto Campfire Podcast. This is the Professor. And Mitch. And today we're going to be talking with David Gold, the CEO of Dapix. But before we start talking to David, let's grab that crypto news from the Crypto Gent. Thanks, Professor. Hello, Crypto Campfire listeners, and welcome to the Cryptocurrency News in a Flash with the Crypto Gent. 2019 Bitcoin transaction volume is no longer led by US, the first time since 2013. Facebook's Mark Zuckerberg calls for digital community self-governance. And Bitfinex market manipulation lawsuit refiled in New York and joined by second case. That's the cryptocurrency news in a flash with the crypto gent. And it's back to you, Professor. Thanks a lot, crypto gent. So Mitch, if you recall, David, we met in Los Angeles at Crypto Invest Summit. We did a live stream with him. Um, some of you guys have probably heard that stream, but I'm guessing a lot of you haven't. So I'm looking forward to talking more with David and getting more in depth about the FIO protocol and how Dapix is helping to uh, make that happen. So without further ado, David, welcome to the show. Thanks. I'm glad to be here. Yeah, it's glad to have you. It's exciting to talk to you again, do a little bit of catching up and uh, maybe figure out kind of what stage of development you're in with this whole thing. So um, first off, before we get too deep, how did you get into crypto and what got you hooked? Yeah, so I, I, uh, I was a venture capitalist immediately prior to, to launching the FIO protocol through Dapix. Dapix is a venture-backed company whose mission in life is to build the initial version of the FIO protocol, which will be given to the foundation for inter-wallet operability itself, which is where FIO comes from. Uh, that is FIO. Uh, and then, then it'll be launched in the mainnet and open source in Q1. And so um, I led blockchain investments for our fund, and uh, it was my experience with crypto starting about four years ago that led me down the crypto rabbit hole and, and led me to really think about solutions around usability because I'm also a former dot-com entrepreneur. So during the dot-com days, I built and ran a B2B procurement company, raised over $25 million and Venture capital navigated through the crash of 2001, had an M&A event after that. Um, and honestly, uh, when I first dove into crypto, it was the first time since the World Wide Web that I felt a, in a similar way. And what I mean by that is, on the one hand, I was like, wow, this could be game changing. On the other hand, using the technology, I was like, wow, this really sucks. This is really bad. It's it's complicated. It's It's scary. It's hard to use. And... You know, not dissimilar to when I opened my first Mosaic web browser on dial-up in, you know, 1993. It, it was both amazing and sucked at the same time. Right. So that, that was the genesis for the ideas behind the FIA protocol, whose whole mission in life is to make all blockchains um, much more usable than they are today. You know, one thing I was just talking about with my wife yesterday is that Bitcoin is kind of like the Netscape of you know, the internet and actually probably before it's probably like the ARPANET of the internet, you know, it's uh, that would be, a, a, that would be a much better comparison. It is the ARPANET of the internet. Yeah. Cause, cause even Netscape is too polished for Bitcoin, you know, if we're realistic here. So there, <laughs> this is so early, it's such a cool technology, but the interface is just so uh, terrible for those who are not excited about technology like we are to say the right. least. And the goal of the field protocol in, at the highest level the, the goal of the field protocol is to deliver the kind of results for the blockchain ecosystem that another protocol called the hypertext transport protocol delivered for the internet. And it was HTTP that made the internet easy to use. And it was HTTP that caused usage on the internet to explode. So our goal with the field protocol is to provide homogeneous usability across all blockchains in a completely decentralized, secure, and private manner uh, that enables usage to explode. But I think that's a really important thing too. And it's going to be a huge phase in achieving the, you know, the, the term that nobody likes to use mass adoption. You know, you've, you've got to have that usability and you've got to have that additional like information layer too, to really flesh it out and make it a, a usable thing at its best. What do you envision FIO doing to revolutionize the blockchain space uh, on like kind of a detailed level? Yeah, so the FIO protocol is its own blockchain. It's a decentralized um, service layer. It sits alongside every other blockchain. 
and it provides a layer of workflow confirmations and data about the sending of value on other chains, but it does not send that value. Um, and by doing this, it works seamlessly out of the box with every single blockchain that exists today or in the future, because it does not integrate with any of those blockchains. And specifically what that means for users with our mainnet launch are, will be three core capabilities uh, that will be enabled um, right at mainnet in Q1 of next year. Uh, no longer any need for users to have to know or see what a public address is. Uh, the ability to use human readable FIO addresses instead. The ability to not only send, but to request payments, which is critically needed functionality. Most transactions in commerce start with a request for payment, a bill, an order card, an invoice, a check. Those are all requests for payment. That concept largely doesn't exist in blockchain, and in a world of immutable ledgers where transactions are irreversible, you don't want mistakes, and the path to error-free transactions are requests for payment. Uh, and third is uh, something I just alluded to, which is data, FIO data. What is FIO data? It is cross-chain metadata that goes along with transactions and works identically, therefore, with any transaction on any chain. The ability to include a note, the ability to include a full structured data set like an order card that shows up right with the transaction in the wallet with the payment request. That's what FIO will deliver at mainnet launch, and then the roadmap after that is very rich, including things like uh, enabling decentralized recurring payments, fee splitting, uh, the ability to have secure decentralized multi-signature routing, and a whole bunch of other things. Okay, so so basically what you're saying in a nutshell is you take a person's name that they come up with, right? Their domain name. So like you're going to send, or Mitch is going to request funds from you and you're going to send those funds to Mitch and Mitch's name or username is therefore attached to an address? Is that how, am I understanding this right? Somewhat. So oh, it uh -huh. has a construct of a username on a domain. So somewhat similar to an email address, username, domain sort of construct. Um, it has a different delimiter. We don't use an at, at symbol, use a colon, but a similar construct. And yeah, you, most users will just pick a username on their wallets domain in the similar way that to how most users just have a Gmail or Hotmail email address, they don't register their own domain. But businesses will register their own, dom own domain and some you know, power users will register their own domain as well. Uh, yes, and at that point, with FIO, that's a FIO address, you can send to a FIO address, you just use the FIO address to send to it. You don't have to worry about the public address because yes, it does provide the mapping to the public address. Right, um, so then it deciphers whether it's a Bitcoin transaction, a Litecoin transaction, and so forth, correct? Right? Well, correct, because when you're sending a, a payment or a request in that, you would specify I'm requesting, you know, 0.1 BTC, for example. And in that, okay. you would have, you know, data. It could be a note. You know, this is for, you know, your share of rent. Uh, you know, it could be the note. Or this is, here's your order card for checking out from overstock.com. Uh, so now you can, you know, make your payment of 0.1 BTC for your order card. Um, so... Um, that's the transactions completely change from how they are today. Uh, the transactions occur completely in the wallet. Uh, you don't have all this extra wallet uh, activity that has to go on today between right. counterparties in order for there to be a transaction in the wallet. And by the way, those extra uh, wallet uh, uh, steps are not only cumbersome and not only create risk of errors, they're also risk of hacking. I was going to say they create risk of vulnerability, actually. Absolutely, because uh, if, if crypto becomes more popular, sending around a public address through an unsecure or centralized mean is a bad idea because a hacker's virus can sniff for those and just swap them out. And you're going to have right. no way to know that the Bitcoin address that showed up in your email that you thought was the one sent by your other person actually was replaced by a virus, and now you're sending right. it off to a hacker. So FIO also <laughs> solves the hacking risks that, that exist around, around the steps that lead up to a transaction. That's pretty cool. What, let me ask you this. What are your thoughts on 5G? And how, do you think it's something that's a necessity for these things to exist? Well, I think 5G is going to be very cool. I don't think 5G is a necessity for blockchain to be successful because blockchain in and of itself is not a high bandwidth consumption activity. The process of 
you know, committing a send out of your wallet is actually really low bandwidth requirement. Um, so today with, you know, with blockchain and, and the things that I believe blockchain will be used for first, um, you know, I, well, I think 5G is cool. I don't think 5G is at all uh, a requirement or an enabler for, for blockchain. So I'm kind of curious what your opinion is on what China is doing in the blockchain space. You know, how they talk about how they start banning things and then they embrace it and then they go and ban other things. And there's a lot of manipulation at play. Do you have an opinion on that? You know, I, it's just, you know, conjecture for my, my point, because I have, you know, no inside information on what's going on in China, but I, you know, it's a bit of an enigma sort of what's going on there. I, I suspect that, Part of it is potentially internal disagreements, even among the, you know, the powers that exist there in in the Communist Party um, about what they should be doing with blockchain, and that may be why it seems like from the outside that they're kind of going back and forth on on what they will do with blockchain. Um, so I think on the one hand they see some benefits to it um, in terms of what it could do for China. Um, on the other hand when it comes to anything that would cause lack of government control there, I would suspect that they really do not like that at all. Um, I mean, everything is controlled by the government from my understanding there and all data that's there is available to the government. You know, the concept of privacy really doesn't exist in China like it exists in the West. So that's, uh, that's my thoughts. Yeah. I'm pretty much right there with you on that. I I feel like there's so much, like you say, they just want to have their hands in every little part of it. And so I, I think that's the logic behind how this is playing out, in my opinion. Sorry, Mitch, go ahead. No, I, that's fine. I, w- I was just going to interject and say, you know, I, I, I kind of think it's, I look at it like this. Um, when you see something or when somebody sees something that's really beneficial or really, they can really monopolize or benefit from, the first thing that they're going to do is make it, not so glamorous, make it look terrible, make it be outlawed, so to speak, like Japan, like the, the East did. Um, and then because really they weren't ready for it. And now this gives them time to reevaluate their own situations. And then all of a sudden, Oh yeah, blockchain. Cool. We're going to do this. And you know what I mean? So they, they kind of suppress the movement a little bit to help put themselves in a better position. Um, that's my take on it. I don't know if it's true or not, but kind of how I look at it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we can only really speculate, right. You know, yeah. like, like, like we said, we're all, you know, based on hearsay at this point, because unless you're really sitting there and understanding what's happening in your own country and seeing it all firsthand and getting all the sides of it, you really are only going to get a, a limited perspective, you know, with the, you're, you're limited to what the media feeds you. And that's, that's literally it other than maybe a few interactions in social media and, it kind of goes to show you that regardless of how connected we are, we're still, there's still a lot of separation, you know, across borders, you know, crypto is going to start getting us there too. It's one, one more thing that kind of enables another connection between people. But um, as technology expands and starts hitting more corners of the world and, and it becomes more, more effective and more of the people that are using these, the young people these days, that are using these social media platforms so much once they start having influential positions uh, we'll start seeing some things change and, and I, I'm hoping that we kind of get some more interconnectedness because I know, I know a lot of people love their country and it's only their country and they love borders. And, um, I, but there's something powerful about having an entire global connection and being able to truly create things uh, on a global scale without limitations. So I, I think that's going to bring a huge revolution to all industries as a whole. Absolutely. Yeah, no, I think you're right. This is such a powerful movement. It really is. And there's so many that can benefit from it. And there's so many, I shouldn't say there's so many. There's quite a few that are going to lose their benefit because of it, right? And and those are the ones that have been able to manipulate the system. And those are the ones that have been able to um, establish power based on financial standing and and I think crypto is really threatening that for a lot of people. And it's threatening control, just like you said, David, about, you know, uh, China or the, the East having full control over their people. I think, I think cryptocurrencies and blockchain technologies um, and the computer, you know, the internet, everything is getting harder and harder to police on a daily basis because, you know what, evolution just continues. 
So, you know, there's never where they can actually just sit back and say, okay, yeah, we, we, got, we got this under control because you know what? They don't, <laughs> they right, really right. don't only for a minute. They might, but you know what? Uh, truth prevails and freedom I think is, uh, is the biggest part of this, this entire movement, you know, freedom and collaboration. I mean, think about how much collaborations happened between countries, people in countries working together on these things. That to me is, is spectacular. Yeah, no, I think that's really great. So David, I'm going to go the other direction because I like to think about like future advancements and, and some of the crazy stuff that's totally unrelated to crypto that could potentially happen. And I'm curious what your favorite sci-fi theory is of, of what tech is going to look like in the next 20 to 30 years. I don't know if I'd use the word crazy, but um, <laughs> you know, in 20 years, the disruption that artificial intelligence is going to have is, is going to be enormous. And uh, you know, people, you don't see it coming because people think linear, linearly and they think statically. They don't think exponentially and dynamically. And technology moves at an exponential rate and things change dynamically over time very quickly. And the impact of AI in 20 years will be extraordinary in both a good and a bad way. Um, the productivity it will create will be enormous. The problems it will solve will be enormous. Uh, traffic on roads will be a thing of the past. Cities that are doing 10 and 20 year plans and talking about the roads that they'll need and who are ignoring the, ignoring the advances in technology show the flaws of most governments because in 10 or 20 years, you won't need more roads because all the cars on highways will be automated and driving you know, six inches from each other like electronic trains. Mm -hmm. uh, and the capacity will go up many fold from what it is today. Um, so, so, you know, it's going to be a very interesting world in 20 years. You know, I, I, that's also going to mean a lot of job destruction for humans and, you know, uh, an open question, and this is coming from somebody who's certainly not a Luddite, um, but a real open question this time about where are the new jobs going to come from? Um, you know, with AI and the things that it can do where you're talking about replacing not just, you know, not blue collar jobs, but white collar jobs significantly as well. Um, you know, there's an open question about, about how that is going to unfold and, and what happens. You know, we had a similar conversation about this a while back. And one of the things we talked about was how the need to work actually changes over time. Um, as this type of technology increases and maybe, maybe there is less need for jobs in the future in that your data and your uh, interactions with the machines that are currently running everything is valuable in its own way enough so that you actually now have extra time or lower costs or for somehow that all kind of works together to eliminate the need for as many jobs. Now, I mean, obviously you're not going to have everybody experiencing that there's still always going to be classes and there's still going to be things that happen like that. But you know, that's, that's one theory. So since we're on the topic of AI, David, are you a iRobot guy or a Renaissance man? You know, it's a, uh, it's, it's an interesting question. And I do, uh, I, I do think a lot about and, and wonder about, you know, what will happen uh, when we get to what's called AGI, um, which is, you know, uh, AI that has intelligence that, that you know, equates to human intelligence. Um, and, and in that context at that point, if the AI is able to be self-improving, you get what's called a breakout where AI can rapidly far exceed human capabilities. And, you know, what, what does a world like that look like? And, and how does AI treat humans and think about humans. And even in a world where, where AI is able to do most everything, um, you know, because AI includes robots as, you know, both physical robots as well as AI that doesn't have to exist in a, ro in a robot or even in a single computer. Um, you know, in that world, are, are humans going to be happy? When we talk right. about, gee, not working, but truthfully, will most humans truly be happy if they had to do nothing? If everything was taken care of and they didn't have to worry about food or water or shelter or anything, heck, even taking care of their kids, robots can, you know, take care of their kids and change diapers and everything. I mean, if you truly have no responsibilities and are worry-free, 
I'm not so sure that most humans are going to be happy that way, but um, how boring would that be? My God. Right? There, there's some of us, you know, that like to build things and actually create stuff, but there's a lot of people that are content just, you know, working their butt off day in and day out to come home and, and do that routine every day. And that's the majority realistically, you know, I, I think it'll be really interesting to see how people's mindset evolves over time. You know, when we were talking with Paul McNeil, we talked about how, you know, like the, right now you talk about technology making people lazy and, you know, this, the concept of the fact that you have these, uh, tools at your disposal that make you have to work less, you know, it doesn't necessarily make you lazy, but it's, there's a shift, right? Where we use these tools for fun and enjoyment because we're working so hard that we finally get these new things and we're like, Hell, let's play with it. Let's have fun. Let's relax. But eventually over time you start turning those tools into actual tools and not using them for fun. And then that actually allows you to open up more free time of where you can find more things to do for entertainment and then work harder. You find things that you want to work on. I don't know. I think people's heads are going to change a lot going forward too. Yeah. It, that's certainly a a future. It'll be interesting to see how it unfolds. I just, I like to think about, you know, how, how boring it would be. And, you know, I mean, it's kind of like, if you went through life and never had a disagreement with anybody, if everybody always agreed on everything, oh my God, I would go out of my mind. <laughs> Seriously, that would be boring as hell. Well, you got to get into it once in a while. It would become really, really boring in that world, wouldn't it? <laughs> oh my goodness, <laughs> right? would it not? I mean, seriously, if you don't have debate, if you don't have conflicting ideas, how is there growth? I mean, really? <laughs> conflicting ideas like generate progression in a way, right? Exactly. So, uh, I don't know. I, I, I'm a firm believer in that we can always all – seriously agree to disagree and move forward. And there's so many people that are opposite of that. And I don't know, like I said, it would just be boring having everything done for me and not having to really do anything. I mean, yeah, because we're so worked and we're so accustomed to working to have a break and to take a month or two weeks or a week and do nothing but sit at the beach and just watch the waves roll in, I could probably do that for a short period of time, but eventually it's going to get boring. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I, I don't know. Castle. That. Well, well, yeah, but <laughs> I mean, how many can you them. build, right? Next thing you know, you're building up now. <laughs> yeah. This is crazy. The future will be crazy. It will. It will. You know, and it's, it's going to be, it's going to be interesting to see, what unfolds in the amount of lifespan that's left in me, let alone the lifespans that are left in my kids. I mean, just crazy. Yeah. Well, blockchain will be part of that. So. Oh yeah, uh, for sure. It already is. I mean. Change how the whole world even thinks about value and moving value around and, uh, and storing and protecting value and, privacy around value will be dramatically different uh, in 10 or 20 years. And the funniest thing about that is how much of it's actually in use today. And the average person doesn't even know it. Yeah. That's what, that's what what floors me. We, we pay some of our vendors in crypto, especially the international ones. And man, it's a hell of a lot easier to do that than it is to try and pay them in fiat, which is right (laughs) there. It's so much easier. I love crypto so much. Blockchain is almost critical to that future that we described rather than just going to be a big part of it. Because when you start talking about, let's, let's just talk about the automated cars, like you're talking about driving around. Part of those are going to be, you know, delivery mechanisms and, and you're going to have automated cars that go to automated shops or automated uh, distribution centers or whatever you want to call them and get loaded automatically with whatever item the person ordered from their virtual reality console at home. And that car shows up and drops it off and, how does that work? If, I mean, what, you're going to set up all these different things with different banks and all that. And so you have to trust. No, you, you have to have a system of finance that is universally valuable without any sort of third party entity controlling it. And once you have blockchain or, or some form of cryptocurrency, then what you have is a system where machines can transact with one another automatically. And you just know that that's going to work because you can trust the code, you know, 
it's, it's a really, really difficult thing to do with the traditional banking system. It just can't happen. So that's, that's going to be a, a brick wall that we would run into if we didn't have cryptocurrency. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. Before we wrap up, let's throw a trending hashtags out there today. And right now we can pick between two. You can choose things that shouldn't exist or ruin a holiday song. So um, <laughs> either tell us what shouldn't exist or ruin a holiday song for us. So I would pick the first one. You're, you're, you're wanting me to tell you what uh, things shouldn't exist? Yep. Tell me what you think shouldn't exist. Uh, what shouldn't exist? Uh, boy, it's hard not to get political with this one, so I guess I'll go political. All right. but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's a deep rabbit hole, David. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, things that shouldn't exist are presidential debates that are controlled by two political parties as if it's their personal monopoly. That shouldn't exist. Yeah, so that's a oh, shit. federal election system that provides huge amounts of money to two political parties and no others because the others can never get the money because they can't get enough money to get enough votes to get the money because the <laughs> two parties fix the system so that only they can get the money from the government um, <laughs> or from the election commission for, for running elections. That should not exist. That's for sure. Uh, so you're saying you we should utilize the DAO for government voting? <laughs> I was going to say, could you imagine <laughs> no, if yes. we did electoral, did elections based on the blockchain? <laughs> yeah, use a DAO for voting. I think it's coming. We're, you know, it's probably going to be just as shitty and controlled by the government, but eventually they're going to try to adopt <sighs> some sort of a system like that, I would think. Yeah. So, and uh, other things that shouldn't exist, hard to get away from things that don't have some political part to them, but um, uh a healthcare system where the price of what is supposed to be paid is completely hidden and obfuscated. That the yeah. person receiving the service at the time of service is not able to say, how much will this cost me? Try that right. doctor sometime. How much will this cost me? And it's impossible for them to tell you. And it's not really their fault. That should not exist. A system where, um, where colleges and universities complain constantly that they don't have enough money, and yet the government provides endless loans to anybody essentially who has a pulse, which is essentially free money for universities and colleges that they don't have to worry about repaying or worry about their students repaying. They don't have to worry about either of those. All they have to do is keep spending that money. So what do they do? They keep spending the money because they can't control their costs. <laughs> right. And then everybody complains about the amount of debt and how much college costs, and they yeah. Uh, point to the, the debt that the government gave is, is a bad thing. And, and it is a bad thing because they gave it without any, any you know, uh, strings attached to the colleges and universities say, hey, we're going to give a loan for the student that you're going to teach and educate. Guess what? If they default on the, flow, on the loan, you're on the hook for part of it because you need to teach them something actually useful so they can repay this loan. Oh, we have awoken a giant. My God, I yeah. love this. this is, I would say this is definitely the best answer to a trending hashtag <laughs> in, ever. Yeah, and clever. my my answer, if I was going to go down a political rabbit hole, my answer is two words from your very first response, and that's just political parties, period, because, there you go. <laughs> I mean, right. come on. <laughs> but anyway. My answer, is, my answer is really simple. Fees. Fees. Get rid of fees. Yeah. <laughs> I'm tired of fees. <laughs> Fucking hate fees. Right? On Transaction top of, fees. On top of membership Same payments. Fees. On top of this. On top of everything's got a freaking fee at that. I'm tired of it. <laughs> yeah. Fees for your fees. Oh my God, David! I loved your rant. That was amazing. <laughs> your, yeah, it was. That sounds it was like, like <laughs> the second episode. Uh, oh my God! It was feelings about things that shouldn't exist. That was an easy. It was such me. the crescendo <laughs> of this podcast. Amazing. <laughs> well, so the last thing that shouldn't exist is really effing hard to use blockchains. So we're coming back to where we started, and that's what we're going to okay. change. So right, people, people want to learn more about what we're doing. Can go to fofio.foundation. All the information, demo videos, white paper, everything is there. All our twenty-seven industry partners are listed there. Our investors. We've got a half dozen venture funds behind us, Finance Labs, NGC, Lunex, uh, Blockwall Capital, others. Um, all the information is there on what we're doing, how we are going to make blockchain um, easy to use um, for everyone in an identical way across every single token and coin, every single blockchain. Definitely. David, thank you so much for coming on the show. It was a great talking to you. It was great to talk to you awesome. again. And I'm really looking forward to the next one. Maybe we can get another one scheduled here shortly. Absolutely. Absolutely. Awesome, awesome. Thank you so much, David. It was a pleasure tonight.
Glad to be here. Thank you. Yeah, have, have a great awesome. rest of your week. Bye. That was a fun one. That he's got so much energy, and and when you when you like really finally get it out of him, it's great. It was really awesome talking to him at CIS. If you guys didn't check that out, go on our YouTube youtube.com slash crypto campfire podcast there is a playlist for the cis live streams and you can find david gold in there and check out the live stream either with him there at cis it was a lot of fun I, I i enjoyed his energy then and i really you know that podcast ended on such an awesome note i i love that passion that flowed out of him at the <laughs> that end was there. Perfect. Just, oh it was awesome it was so awesome that was a perfect question so Guys, thanks for joining us tonight. Have a we'll good talk night. to you guys later. Have a good night. Take it easy. Peace.